Never underestimate Belieber fever. It's almost as strong as the human will to survive, and it took both those things to free the Turpin 13 from their evil parents. In this episode, let's go inside the Turpin family house of horrors and wait until you hear what fresh hell the Turpin kids have been dealing with since their parents were arrested. I'm Chris, and this is True Crime Recaps. If you like getting all the crime in half the time, I hope you'll give this a like and subscribe to join my wife Amy and I for new recaps right here every week. So, here's how Justin Bieber helped a scared, abused teenage girl save herself and her 12 brothers and sisters from a living hell. At 17, Jordan Turpin had a secret phone she kept hidden from her captors, David and Louise, otherwise known as mother and father. But it wasn't just any phone. It was a window to the world outside the bedrooms she and her 12 brothers and sisters weren't allowed to leave. And like a lot of teenage girls, she fell in love with Justin Bieber. And through his videos and interviews, she learned there was a whole world out there where kids weren't chained to their beds for months at a time. And punishments didn't involve dog cages and bloody beatings. And food was plentiful. She was taking a big risk, but she thought it was worth it just to catch a glimpse of something beautiful. Then, when one of her sisters told her mother she was watching the videos, she was almost choked to death. She thought that was going to be the day she died for sure. And after that, the nightmares wouldn't stop. But when Jordan overheard their parents say they were moving to Oklahoma in a few days, she knew the truth. If she didn't find the courage to get help, her little brothers and sisters wouldn't survive the trip. On January 14th, 2018, she made her move. In the dead of night, Jordan pried open a window of the family's Paris, California home and ran down the street clutching a deactivated old cell phone. And here's the 911 call she made. 911 emergency, what are you reporting? Um, hello? This is 911, do you have an emergency? Uh, I just want to leave from home because I live in a family of 15. Okay, can you hear me? And we have abusing parents. Did you hear that? Okay, how did they abuse you? Okay, they hit us, they throw us across, they like to throw us across the room. They pull our hair, they, they yank out our hair. I have two, my two little sisters right now are chained up. Okay, how old are you? I'm 17. What's your name? Jordan Turpin. And you have to remember, she was only allowed outside a few times a year, and she didn't know about sidewalks, and no one had ever taught her not to stand in the middle of the street, and she didn't know how to tell the dispatcher her address or how to read the street signs. Even spelling her last name took some time, and when asked if she went to school, she said, a fake school is set up. I haven't finished first grade, and I'm 17. Moments after she called 911, the first sign of help arrived. Hey, what's going on? Okay. I just ran away from home. Okay. And I live in a family of 15. Okay. My two little sisters right now are chained up. They're chained up? Yes. Where are they chained up at? On the bed. Now, mother didn't chain them up just to be me. Okay. Okay. They're chained up because they stole mother's food. Uh huh. But I'm sorry if I talk too much. Okay. I've never talked to anybody out there, so I don't. I d I've never been alone with the person, so <clears throat> this is very hard for me to talk. Okay. How did you? Do your parents know you left your house? No, they don't. Do you take any medication? What's the medication? Medication? Yeah. What's the medication? Do you take pills? Do you take pills? Oh, I don't think I've ever taken a pill before. Okay. Right, I have it. Um. Think about the kind of risk she was taking at that moment. If the deputy took her home and left her alone with her parents, they would have killed her. And in an interview with 2020, she told Diane Sawyer she was genuinely afraid they might attack her even with the police standing there. Fortunately, the officer asked a smart question. Did she have any pictures to prove what she was saying? Luckily, she did. He took one look at the image of a starving, dirty little girl with her wrists shackled in chains and called for backup. 
Jordan hid in the patrol car while he knocked on the Turpin family door. It looked like every other house on the block, but inside, the kids were going through hell. It took almost a full three minutes for Louise and David Turpin to open up. Were they sleeping? Trying to put on clothes? No, they'd been trying to take chains off two little girls they were holding captive in their bedroom. When they stood aside to let the officer come in, they were out of breath, but trying to act normal. Their 13 kids ranged in age from 2 years old to 29. They were allowed to eat only one meal per day, and that was usually snack food or fast food. They were all dangerously close to starvation. The oldest girl weighed just 82 pounds, yet somehow David and Louise thought they could get out of trouble just by acting like everything was fine. Wow. Now here's the moment when they started to realize their twisted parenting style was going to get them thrown in jail. Ma'am, why don't you step over here for a minute? Mm -hmm. Okay, with you. And sir, step over here for a second. Just step over with my partner here for a second. You got any weapons on you? They were arrested less than two hours later. Now, let me tell you about the level of squalor those kids were living in. The house reeked of urine and excrement. Emergency workers had to breathe through their mouths. The sick punishments humans dream up to hurt each other is appalling. And what they inflicted on their kids was one of the worst cases of child abuse in California history. The bathroom was off limits to them for months at a time. They were being punished for doing things like playing with the water when they washed their hands, but it's more accurate to say that they were just washing their hands and Louise and David called that playing with the water. The smell of the house clung to the kids' dirty hands and faces. The oldest Turpin girl, Jennifer, knew all about that. She went to public school until third grade, and every day she was there, she was bullied mercilessly for the way she smelled and the dirty clothes she wore. If only a teacher or a counselor had stepped in to find out what was going on at home, maybe things would have been different. On the other hand, maybe questions were being asked because Louise pulled her out of school without an explanation. She never went back, and the rest of the kids never spent a day in school. All 13 kids were born in a hospital, but that was the last time they ever saw a doctor or a dentist. What I'm trying to say is that no other adults had any interaction with them, which is why David and Louise got away with it for so long. The two of them met when she was 16 and he was 23. According to her sister Elizabeth, author of Sisters of Secrets, the story of sisters leading up to the Turpin case arrest, David checked her out of high school in Virginia, and the two of them got married and ran away to Texas. Louise was one of six kids born to a small-town preacher. As a married couple, she and David claimed to be Pentecostal Christians, but they didn't go to a regular church. The abuse started when the family was living near Fort Worth, Texas. At first, it was neglect, but every year when another kid was born, it broke down farther and farther into physical and emotional abuse. The timeout corner turned into being tied up with ropes to being restrained with chains. A neighbor remembers them coming home with eight new children's bicycles that were never used. The bikes just sat outside untouched. That's one of the ways David and Louise loved to torture the kids. And then one day, they came up with something new and worse to punish them. They locked the ten oldest into a trailer hidden deep on their property and just drove away. When they remembered, they came back once a week to drop off food. For the next few years, the kids being held captive tried to ration what they ate, never knowing if they were going to eat again or when. And when the food ran out, they ate ketchup and mustard out of plastic packets and chewed ice trying to stave off the hunger pains. Starvation and isolation weren't David and Louise's only methods of punishment. So much of what they did to these kids was psychological. Now get this, as the oldest, Jennifer was forced to lock the kids in dog cages if they broke one of mother or father's rules. If she didn't, she'd find herself locked up and the others would get a worse punishment. Can you imagine being forced to torture your siblings? She thought about suicide a lot, but couldn't bring herself to leave her brothers and sisters alone. Just when they thought they would die in a trailer in the middle of nowhere, David got a new job and they moved to California in 2010. And for the first time in a long time, they were all in the same house again. But that made things worse. And he worked as an engineer for a defense contractor, and he made about $140,000 a year. Louise was meant to be homeschooling the kids, but she didn't teach them a thing. But they did set it up to look like everything was fine from the outside. Their homeschool was registered with the Board of Education. They kept the extended families in West Virginia at arm's length, and they never let them talk to the kids. 
but they did tell them elaborate stories of the good life they were living and all the trips to Disney and Vegas they were taking. She did things like dress them up in matching outfits for picture day. It would be the only time they were allowed outside. She posted the pictures on Facebook to make sure no one suspected what was really going on. But even in all the lies, there was some truth to what she said. The family did take a couple of trips to Vegas. David and Louise were fond of renewing their vows there, and the Elvis Chapel was their favorite. They did it on their 26th, 28th, and 30th anniversaries. And they brought all the kids with them every time except for the first time. You know, all the kids were dressed in matching outfits. The Elvis impersonator remembers them dancing around and acting happy. And why wouldn't they? They were being allowed outside for the first time in months. It's normal to wonder why one of the kids didn't try to escape before Jordan made her move in 2018. And the answer is that lifelong abuse is hard to overcome, and you have to remember how isolated they kept the kids. They were meant to be homeschooled, but they had no education. They had no idea how to do any of the things necessary to thrive on their own. And, of course, they grew up knowing nothing but fear and punishment, which normalized it to the point where most of them just believed that was the life they had to deal with. And there was always someone watching. Part of the torture they inflicted was mental. They bribed the kids with food to monitor the others and tell on them if they broke a rule. David worked a 9-to-5 job, and Louise was supposed to be home with the kids, but often wasn't. But the daytime rules were so strict that the kids eventually started sleeping all day and staying up all night when their parents were asleep. For instance, the kids weren't allowed to stand up. They were supposed to be calmly sitting or lying down all the time. They weren't allowed to leave their bedrooms without permission. They were only allowed to shower once a year. And the sun was something they only saw on the secret phone and behind the blinds they were forbidden to open. Louise loved to shop, and she ran up massive credit card bills buying new toys and children's clothes to torture them with. She put the clothes in their closets and the toys right in front of them, but if they dared to touch them, they'd be beaten until they bled. The kids were starving, but Louise would bake pies to test them. If they tried to sneak a bite, they were brutally beaten. The only thing they were allowed to do was write. And the kids kept journals of their lives of pain. Hundreds of them were found in the house when it was raided after Jordan brought help. And they proved to be shocking, but useful documentation of the hell that was inflicted on them. Is it strange that David and Louise let them write it all down? Is it even weirder that they kept the journals over the years? Yes and yes, but that's the level of delusion they were living at. They'd gotten away with the abuse for so long, they barely registered how wrong it was by the time they finally got caught. So what is clinically wrong with these people? Is there any kind of reason why something like this happened? Well, you tell me. Louise was diagnosed with histrionic personality disorder, a diagnosis which could be applied to any of the real housewives. Orange County, Beverly Hills, New York, take your pick. WebMD tells us that people with these disorders have intense, unstable emotions and distorted self-images. They have an overwhelming desire to be noticed and often behave dramatically or inappropriately to get attention. So, you know, it's n not really any kind of explanation for the horrific abuse she subjected her kids to. And you know, sometimes there's not a reason why people act the way they do. She and her husband were just plain evil people. The prosecutor said that in 20 years of doing this, the Turpin case was one of the most disturbing cases he'd ever seen. The parents pleaded guilty to 14 felony charges and were sentenced to 25 years to life in prison. The kids gave victim statements with the help of Raider, an emotional support dog. Don't you just love those dogs? And if you're anything like us, you're wondering what happened to the Turpin family home in Paris, California. And I've got an answer for you. Even though it was the scene of years of horrific abuse, it still fetched almost $300,000 at a foreclosure auction in 2019. Which just goes to show you that if you want to buy a place for less than $300,000 in California, You'll have to live in a house of horrors. Where are the Turpin 13 now? Well, I'll tell you, those kids can't seem to catch a break. They escaped from a house of horrors only to end up in another dangerous environment. You won't believe this. First, their parents failed them. Now, the system is failing them. 
More than $600,000 was collected from various people and organizations. The money was supposed to help the Turpin kids jumpstart their new future, but that money was put into an official trust overseen by the court and hidden from public oversight, according to an ABC News investigation. But court officials won't reveal how much is left or what it was spent on, but it sure didn't go to the Turpin kids. They were assigned a court-appointed public guardian to manage their money and allocate it toward health care, food, safety, housing, and education. But the original administrator working with them was completely unavailable to them and barely gave them the time of day. One of the Turpin boys told 2020 that when he asked for money to buy a bicycle so he could get around, she turned it down. No explanation, just no. And when he asked her for help, she would tell him to go Google it. Can you believe that? And for the Turpins that were placed in foster homes, the conditions were almost as bad as what they had grown up with. The kids were re-abused, and one foster parent even told one of the girls that she understood why her parents chained her up. It's honestly horrifying to see the system break down to that level. But since 2020 brought the investigation to light, they say they've been getting more support. As for the Turpin hero, Jordan, she told Good Morning America that she wants to be a motivational speaker someday. In her words, my whole life, it has been so hard for me to understand why everything has happened. But if I can use what I went through to make a difference in the world, then I think that can heal me. And she's well on her way to catching up on the years that were taken from her. She got her high school diploma and she's taking college classes. Her older sister, Jennifer, is on the fast track to be a manager at a local restaurant. And in her off time, she writes and sings Christian pop songs and dreams of being a writer. But the most important thing right now is enjoying life, and she seems to be doing that. She has her own place, her own car, her own pets, a kitten and a bunny. And she's enjoying making her own decisions for the first time. The other Turpin kids are keeping a low profile and staying out of the public eye as much as possible while they heal and focus on regaining those lost years. And that's your recap. What do you think of this story? Are you surprised by how long the Turpins got away with this abuse? And what do you think of the way the system broke down after they escaped the House of Horrors? Let's talk about it in the comments. And remember to hit like and subscribe and the bell so you never miss a new recap. Until next time, take care.